was a deep joy for me to be here, and it feels like I have uh, I've known this congregation um, because of just the connections and the relationship with uh, many of your family. So um, I am grateful for our time, and this has been just a blessing to me to experience the presence of God among us uh, here today. Um, my title this morning, uh, sermon-wise, is Easter Tide, An Invitation to Dance. Um, and I grew up in a Bible church where we, uh, we celebrated uh, Palm Sunday, we observed Good Friday, and then we went right to Easter. And uh, Jesus is risen, hallelujah, hallelujah. he's risen indeed. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we got on with the rest of our life. And it wasn't until much later in my journey, it actually was when I was doing the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which is choosing Christ in the world, and it's a, a journey with Jesus in his incarnation that we took a significant time to just sit with Easter time, which again, I'm going, Easter time? What's Easter time? It's the period between um, the resurrection and Pentecost, 40 days. Mm-hmm. And as we, I immersed myself in this story, uh, what was really uh, kind of captivating to me was that the stories were filled with confusion, fear, um, and not knowing what to do, there was some joy, um, but not one of the stories I noticed that Jesus, uh, that the disciples were actually looking for Jesus. Jesus was always looking for them. <laughs> they were either locked up in a room or they were gone back fishing. Um, something that you prayed, Demi, that just really struck me is that I think the difference in Easter tide is that we have lived our lives wanting to have Jesus join us. When really the invitation of Easter Tide is Jesus saying, I want you to join me and to know my presence. And that to me was just, it was, it was revolutionary in terms of my journey. Right along the same time, I was doing a study on the, uh, on the Trinity and trying to figure out, okay, so what, you know, can I understand this a little bit more? But today, for our little time together, I want to focus on three things. One is that we are born to dance. And two is we don't believe it. It's a struggle. Uh, Again, I grew up in a Bible church tradition where we couldn't dance, couldn't go bowling, couldn't go roller skating, (laughs) because that was where, you know, the bad stuff happened. And, um, And so dancing is very, very uncomfortable for me. I'm very, very self conscious of that. And I still am, even though I've done all this beautiful work spiritually uh, to say Jesus is inviting me to dance, I still feel awkward in, in a group dancing, unless it's in my own room. And then lastly is the invitation of Easter Tide to the dance, to really join into that. So we were born to dance. The Bible says clearly that we were created in the image of God. And that's where the study of the Trinity kind of opened the door for me, too, is I'm recognizing that about 200s to 300s, the church leaders were trying to figure out, so how do we describe this God? We've all grown up in this Jewish tradition. Uh, there's only one God, but what do we do with Jesus and the Spirit? And, and so the word that they came up, there was no word in Trinity. Um, it was never used. But the Greek word that they chose to describe who God is, is the Greek word parakoresis, which we translate in English as the dance or choreography. Mm -hmm. And again, when I read that, I'm going like, what? Because again, my my understanding was God was a hierarchy. It's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I think the church has kind of reflected that kind of, of, of image of God, whereas this is more the sense of this giving and receiving of love. It's relationship. It's not organization. It's not power and control. It's relationship. It's intimacy. And so then, it was Jonathan Edwards and the Puritans that said much later that we are baptized by faith into the community of the Trinity. Which to me again was like, wow, did I hear that right? Did I read that? I didn't hear it because they were way before me. Um, did I read this right? We are invited into this community, into this dance, into this relationship of perfect giving. And re- I do not understand that. That is a mystery to me. 
that the everlasting God who created us wants to invite us into this relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, we were born to dance. Emmanuel, beautiful name, God with us, was God's attempt to say, I want you to understand this, so I am going to enter into this human existence, this human life, so that you could be invited, you could see the, the personal invitation that I am extending to you to join this relationship. And he showed us. Uh, the birth of the church at Pentecost was this birthing of the body of Christ, which is in relationship. Paul describes that. He says, you know, the foot, the hand, the eyes, we're, we're connected, and we all have this part to play in this relationship. It's not an institutional program that I'm trying to establish in earth. This is not another religion. I want you to know that from the very beginning, I have created you for relationship with me. The, the command, again, was not to organize yourself. Jesus didn't say that. Organize yourself. Create this hierarchy. Create this system, this institution to battle evil and to build a kingdom. That's not our job. It's, it's about being in this beautiful relationship with the living God. Amen. Amen. What we have done, I think, over the years is focus so much on purity, which, again, I think it's come back from that fearful place of going, we've, we've missed it. We're not, we're not getting this right. But it's this invitation to holiness which is about being in relationship, this unique, sacred relationship with the living God. The command that Jesus gave his disciples was to wait. Wait for what is promised. Uh, it's the life source of the Spirit that allows us to experience the intimate presence of God and be in this relationship. So it's waiting, it's receiving. It's not going out. Jesus did not say, okay, listen, I'm counting on you. I'm going to build a church. You know, things are evil. We need to fight the evil one, all that other stuff. So you guys better be ready. I've, I've invested three and a half years into your life, and I'm counting on you. It wasn't that at all. He says, no, go wait. And I'm thinking, you know, 10 days. I can wait for maybe 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and then I get kind of itchy. And I'm, I'm imagining, here's day one, here's day two, here's day three, and now they're starting to really wonder, go, okay, did we miss it here? Because Jesus didn't say, wait for 10 days, he just said, wait. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, they're thinking, this is, you know, we're missing it. But wait to receive. Well, God tricked me one day in um, inviting me to kind of look at this relationship with God in a very different way. Charlotte and I, my wife, uh, when we were in Boulder Creek and it rained, we knew the power was going to go out, so we would go to Scotts Valley or Santa Cruz to go to the movies. And so we headed down. There was a movie we wanted to see to Scotts Valley, and uh, we got there late. It was like 20 minutes late, and I'm one. I like the previews. So if I can't see the previews, I don't want to go in. Okay, We've missed the movie, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, so we said, well, we missed that. And the only movie that was next up was Cinderella, 2015. I'm going, oh, it's Cinderella. I said, well, I'm tired. Maybe I'll get a nap. Uh, but we want to get out of the rain, so let's go in. The food is good there. We like that. Uh, the seats are comfortable. So let's go watch this. And so we enter into this theater room. Not much bigger than this, just filled with little girls <laughs> and their sisters and their mothers and their aunts, all dressed in these nice little Cinderella outfits. It was absolutely incredible. And here I am, the only man sitting in the back row with my wife. Um, so I'm going, okay, uh, let's watch the movie. And I'm telling you, God woke me up. I could not go to sleep. And I said, this is the picture. This is the story. Her name was Ella. And as Ella grew up, she lost her mom. Her dad 
like men typically do, can't be alone very long. He's got a daughter, so he reaches out and gets married to this other woman. And uh, she becomes this wicked stepmother. And her and her daughters just torture Cinderella, because Ella, and make her the center of that household. And they nickname her Cinderella because of the cinder ash in her cleaning out of the, uh, of the, uh, the chimney. And so in that situation, I'm going, okay, here's this poor gal that's totally lost and thinking, here I am. There's nothing. There's nothing left. And then the fairy godmother comes in, and she was a character. But I thought, as I'm watching this thing, and the Holy Spirit just poking me, saying, God, pay attention, pay attention. Don't go to sleep. Um, it's the fairy godmother did not change Ella into something other than who she was. She actually just revealed who Ella was all along. This princess. And Ella was awkward. I don't know what to do with this. I'm going to go to the ball. I'm not, not comfortable dancing. I don't know how to dance. What am I going to do? And this whole world opens up for Cinderella. God says, you are my beloved. Do you know that name? I mean, we may read the scriptures, but have you really embraced that you are the beloved son and daughter of the living God? Ecclesiastes, not Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, it's a beautiful, beautiful description of God's love for us. He says, you are precious to me. You are without flaw. And again, when I read that in chapter 2, verse 14, I'm going like, what do you mean? I, I'm full of flaws. But God says, not in my eyes. I pray to you perfectly. Psalm 103 says, I am like a loving parent to my child. I have compassion on you. I know your weaknesses. I know you're just dust. And that's not a flaw. That's precious. That's what I've created you to be. So Paul's excitement. Galatians 5.1. And I'm reading from the, uh, the Eugene Peterson's translation of these passages. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And he underscores that. It's for freedom. Why did Christ set us free? And this is, to me, Easter tide. Jesus is coming and saying, hey, gang, this is why I came. This is what it's all about. And I'm inviting you into this spacious place that you've made very, very small. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ has set us free to live our lives freely. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put you under the harness of slavery. Ephesians 1. And again, so Galatians, well, Galatia was this legalistic church. Uh, they wanted the uh, the Gentiles to become Jews. For, I mean, they had the whole system down. And Ephesus, again, the church very focused on being perfect. <clears throat> and Paul writes this in Ephesians 1. How blessed is God. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, he had us in mind. And had settled on us as the focus of his love. Has settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. It's not to be made something different, it's to be completely whole as God has created and intended us to be. And holy, again, that's not about perfection. Holiness means that there's a sacred purpose, there's a sacred preciousness about each one of us that God has brought into the world. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of this lavish gift-giving by the hand of his son. So we were born to dance, but we struggled believing it. We, we just can't believe it. Paul writes to Galatians again in chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live by grace, the grace of Christ. And you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. 
Galatians 3. He says, how foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Mm -hmm. And that was the environment. Again, people that love me, precious church, but that was the environment that I grew up in. It's trying to earn or prove myself, even though, again, our, our church's name was Grace Gospel Church. <laughs> but boy, we were trying. It was that sense of trying to prove that, you know, that we're good enough, that we're worthy of your love. You've given all for us, so I want to be the best for you, Jesus. And what a burden that became. Um, and I will say that for me. Uh, we all suffer from, uh, I call it, spiritual attention deficit disorder. Um, and that's, again, not a new thing. The disciples, even though Jesus talked them, he lived with them, he walked with them, now, in these 40 days after resurrection, he's looking for him, going, hey, wait, 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 what are you missing? Let me, let me. I, I've, I've already told you this, you know, believe it. Someone has said that not one of us enters this world without being wounded, traumatized, even the people that are closest to us, our parents, that love us in their own imperfect way, do not get who we are. They don't see us. A lot of our reflection through is the, the reflection of our own lives onto them we project. We want them to be good kids. I remember, again, this burden that I put on my two daughters uh, as pastor kids of wanting them, again, to, to look a certain way, wanting them, again, not to bring shame. Uh, that was my own stuff. I believe this is all, hey, Martin, I believe this is all the result of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we ate that and believed the lie that we're on our own, when we believed that uh, you know we could be God, we could be in control, uh, we can we can manage our lives. Fear comes in, so there's shame, there's blame, there's hiding, there's covering up, and we have seen generation after generation after generation exiled from the garden living from that. And sadly, the church through the generations, there have been great awakenings that keep bringing us back, keep bringing us back. But soon we lose sight of that and we start moving through our system again of trying to earn God's love, trying to be perfect, trying to be right. And then we become self-righteous and then we become judgmental. I mean, all that stuff that happens. Um, we're so often taught, again in church, this other gospel just as they were in Galatia. And it's not the good news, because it makes this guilt and the burden of living my life just heavier. Because now I've, I've got the spiritual burden that's on it. I, I better do this. If I really claim, I remember my dad saying to me one time, this is back in the 60s, I had grown my hair a little bit longer, had a mustache, and he's going, you know, son, I just, I don't know that you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, I was, uh, again, really seeking after God. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, how can I tell the difference between you and anyone else in the world by the way you dress and the way you look? And I said, well, hopefully by, <laughs> by my life. Um, but it was such an important thing, this image, this reflection that he had of going, okay, so how do we know? Um, so... As we, as we struggle with this disbelief, if you will, I believe this resurrection, Eastertide, is Jesus coming back to saying, hey, here's the invitation. So, two more little examples. One, I, I just heard a series uh, at church, and this is the subtlety of this. Um, they were doing a, a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And I thought, well, this is really great. But then as I listened to this, the focus was, so this is the fruit of the Spirit, so now go do intentional loving acts. Do random acts of kindness. Be patient. You know? And, and again, I thought, boy, the whole focus is on us trying to produce this. When that's not what Scripture says, it's the fruit of the Spirit. This is a friend of mine just recently said, Part of it is coming to this place to receive 
this love and then to accept it. And what happens then is what is born out in my life is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that I work. It's not something that I try to, to power through. It's not it at all. There was another series that they did on forgiveness at the same church. And again, it was the same thing. Well, the Bible says forgive, which it does. So just forgive. And I said, well, how do you, how do you not metabolize the grief? How do you not metabolize the trauma or whatever the hurt is? And then allow this loving work of God in our lives move us to the place where now my forgiveness is coming freely as opposed with expectations with my forgiveness. And growing up, that was I had two older brothers. So we always had these opportunities, teachable <laughs> moments they called, uh, to, to forgive. <clears throat> and I remember my mom having my brother Ron and myself together, and Ron was angry, hurt, and, uh, and I had messed up. And so she turns to me and says, Don, ask Ron for forgiveness. I was really angry with Ron, and I didn't want to, but I knew that I had to, this beautiful Irish mother that was holding me firmly, and I knew that you know, I, I've got to do this, even though inside of me, like that little boy that was sat in the corner, and they said, you sit here, and he goes, no, I want to get up. No, you sit here, you sit here. And then finally in frustration, he looks at his mom, and he says, Mom, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> that's what I was feeling there, yeah. saying, no, I don't want to forgive. But, okay, Ron, will you forgive me? And then she turned to Ron and says, now, Ron, tell Don you forgive him. And he didn't <laughs> want to forgive me. But that, that's this, this focus that we have as Christians. We're going, well, this is what we're supposed to do, so let's just do it. As opposed to, no, it's about receiving the love, the compassion, the forgiveness of God, accepting that and seeing it move forward from us. So John 15, Jesus says, I'm inviting you. This is why I've created you. I'm the vine, you're not. I'm the source, you're not. But you are a branch. That does nothing for my ego to be a branch. But that's the design. He says, this is the dance. <clears throat> Abide in me. Make your home in me as I make my home in you. That's the command. There's no command there about doing all this stuff that looks like a Christian. He's saying, no, that's not the focus. And then in verse 9 he says, make your home in my love. As the Father has loved me, I am loving you. Now you can love others, each other. But it comes from the abiding, not from going out and saying, here's the command, I've got to love so-and-so, so I'm just going to love them. I'm just going to forgive them. And realizing that, you know what, I'm, I'm exhausted. I can do that for a while until I'm getting exhausted or someone hits me blindside. I'm at, the, I'm at my wit's end and someone hits me and then all of a sudden I just like explode. And then I turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. Well, the Bible says, no, I, you know where that came from. Or, no, that's just not me. Oh, well, excuse me. Uh, no, it's, it's there. Pay attention. So the invitation is to know, and he says this in John 15, I want you to know my joy and that your joy will be complete. And it comes from this relationship, this dance, this holy dance that he's invited us to. I'm a slow learner. And I'm still trying to learn this and process this, so that's the confession. Um, but again, God tricked me one night when uh, I heard that Jerry Rice, who used to play for the 49ers, he's this elegant-looking superstar, graceful as anything on the, on the football field, um, and he was going to be on Dancing with the Stars. Well, I had no interest in watching a dancing program. But I did have interest in watching Jerry Rice. And so I turned it on, and Jerry was there, and I watched him every week. And Bruno, the judge, was just at his wit's end with Jerry. And I remember one time, this maybe four or five weeks into the, the series, he said, Jerry, 
I don't understand why America keeps passing you through every week. You're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> On the football field, you're grace in motion. He's this animated Italian. He says, but here in the dance floor, you're wooden and stiff. You're in your head. You're trying to get your feet perfect. And then he said this, where the Holy Spirit says, again, Don, wake up, pay attention. He says, Jerry, trust your partner. Hmm. Jerry, surrender to the music. Don't worry about your feet. They'll come along. And I thought, wow, this is the invitation of Easter Tide. Jesus says, it's not about you. It's about us. It's about allowing you to trust me to lead. And as I'm watching again the dancers, I'm seeing there's this, there's this connection. There's a relationship. And then I start watching other dancing shows. And the judges again come in, these, these kids that want to be professionals. And they said, you are, you are an exceptional technical dancer, but you're horrible. Because there's no connection. You're not connected to the music. You're not connected to your partner. You're not connected to your audience. You're just trying to be perfect. I thought, wow, this is it. It's the invitation to connect. Well, the reason we want to be perfect is because we're afraid. We don't really have accepted and received the sense that we are the beloved of God. And if we can let that permeate into our hearts and minds that it's not about performance, but it's about relationship, it's about being connected with the with with our God through the Holy Spirit, it's it's beautiful. So trust and surrender. And surrender, I thought about that word too a lot, in terms of uh, surrender for a man, I think often means giving up. It's defeat. <coughs> for a woman, surrender is fearfully... I, I'm I'm going to be overpowered. I've, I've got to give it up. And then I thought of this as I was praying more about that, that surrender is this entrusting ourselves. It's the entrusting ourselves to the other, to God. So trust and surrender. Listen and let go. The biblical word in the Hebrew that we use, that we translate obey in English, means to hear. Which again, I'm on the duty side. That's what I grew up in. You know what to do. To him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him that is sent, just obey. Just obey. And going, no, it means to hear. And if I'm really hearing, then this heart of stone, heart of stone, is transformed into a heart of flesh. And then what comes in and what comes in from the Holy Spirit fills me in a way that what comes out. And then I'm surprised. You know, my reaction isn't harsh in a certain circumstance and going, like, wow, that was freeing. That was exciting. It must be the Holy Spirit doing God's work. We were born to dance. We were created in the image of God by love, of love, and for love, to be in union with God. We struggle to believe it because our own human experience in this world and because we've been taught to be more like Pharisees than to be in relationship with Jesus. And that's the invitation today. The question is, will we say yes to the invitation? And that yes has to come every day. For me, it has to come multiple times during the day because I get easily threatened. Things happen and I'm trying to defend myself. Things happen, I'm trying to defend a reputation. And it's this image that I want other people to believe about me, that he's a good, faithful follower of Jesus. That's a lot of pressure to put on me. As opposed to being amazed by the grace of God that says, you are my child. Believe it. You're my child. Be in relate. Take my hand. Let's go. Let's, let's dance. So where do I begin to support this? I believe um, we need to kind of connect with being present here right now. I think nature the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The Apostle Paul says, you know what? God has revealed himself. We don't need anything else. The scriptures are important. I'm not discounting that, but this is what Paul says. If 
All we had was nature. He says, everything that is revealed about God that needs to be revealed, God has already done that. Job says, go, go talk to the animals. I love Mary Oliver's poem, When I'm Among the Trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, equally the beech and the oaks and the pines. They give us such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save my life daily. And I'm so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry or through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and they call out and they say, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into this world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light mm. and to shine. Mm. That is the invitation to us. That's what we've been created for. We are the only creatures of God that want to be something other than what God created us to be. <laughs> so start where you are. Start in your body. I've lived my entire life disconnected from my body and always in my strategic mind because I want to get it right. I want to be perfect. I want this image to be portrayed. But my body never lies. And, and what I'm discovering, because I'm trying to discern, okay, when am I walking in the spirit, when am I not? I can feel it right in my gut, which is sizable. But when I feel this tightening, to me it's this message from the Holy Spirit and from my body saying, something's off there. You're tightening in fear. What are you defending? What are you trying to protect? Can you surrender? Can you join me in the dance? And so that's the invitation today. Mm -hmm. There are other things I would encourage to support you. There's spiritual direction, there's retreats, there's times that you can get away and just take a walk. Take a run like Martin did. Uh, be out there uh, disconnected from devices and just listen to it going, okay, where am I noticing? How can I listen more attentively to, uh, to what the Holy Spirit is saying? Our ministry that Charlotte and I run is just an invitation to give the space for people to actually do that, to listen. And you're welcome to join us uh, on any of those things. In fact, we're going to Ireland on a contemplative uh, pilgrimage retreat this coming September. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the whole invitation is going, how do I listen to this still small voice that's right there in my deep longing to be there? I close with this scene. The 2015 Cinderella. It's not animated. The real actors. But I remember the scene, her getting out of the carriage, all nervous and anxious. When she comes into the ballroom, where everyone is all, you know, all dressed up and congregating around, and all of a sudden everything stops. And all the attention goes to the top of the stairs. And they see Ella. Not Cinderella, Ella. And she comes down the stairs. The prince pauses and he looks and his eyes are just captivated. And as they come close, he looks in her eyes, she looks in his, and he says, it's you. And her response is, it's you. And then he says to her, will you give me the privilege of leading you in this dance. And it caught me emotionally. I was surprised. I was like, wow, there's this tenderness. His arm comes around her waist. He draws her close. She takes this little, takes her breath away. And then she doesn't know what to do with this other hand. And so he just offers it up and she just pops it over. And they start. And you can just feel kind of this self conscious. <clears throat> and the stiffness but as they continue to move around the floor she becomes more relaxed and then like in the ballroom dancing I'm not going to do it here for you but it's that, that total surrender of, of trust of leaning back and he's holding and then he lifts her and at that point everyone's around watching and they gasp <gasps> and I thought this is what the world is longing to see our loving creator in relationship with 
his creatures, you and me. That takes the breath away when we're in this dance, doing what God has created us to be, to be in union with him. Can I pause in prayer? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for this invitation. I think as Paul described it in chapter 3 of Ephesians, uh, it's beyond our comprehension. Lord, this, this love, the height and the depth and the width and the length of this love that's that's so, so incredible. We've never experienced that in our human relationships on this world, in this world. We've experienced the bullying. We've experienced people not seeing us or getting us. We've experienced all of those rejections and in places where we've had to defend and protect ourselves. But Lord, you invite us to this love that sees us, that knows us, that has created us, knit us together in our mother's womb for the purpose of being in union with you, to enjoy the freedom of this dance, this dance of love, that we may experience the fullness of our life that you've created to give us, the fullness of our joy because it's your joy poured into us. It's your delight poured into us. So we ask today for the grace and the courage and the capability to believe that this is why we're here. This is the life that you've created us for, not the one that we're trying to create to be safe, but the life to live fully who you have created us for your glory, for our joy, and for the healing and blessing of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.